Greetings out there again. Welcome to another chat with an artist in the exhibition. My name is Raul Zamudio, the curator of Exodus 3, Mexico, New York. That's somewhat up at White Box. Uh, we're hoping to actually materialize the exhibition, but in the meantime, I'm doing these conversations with artists. And today we have Blanca Amesqua, um, who I would probably say is a sort of kind of interdisciplinary artist since uh, um, looking at the body of her work so far, it's quite diverse. And hopefully she'll be sharing some insights about um, her work, her development, her formation, and how she arrived here from New York. So welcome, Blanca. First of all, I'd like to start off by um, asking you where you were born. Um, hi, Raul. Nice to see you. Uh, I was born in Mexico City. And when did you get to, um, I know that you studied in Fresno, was there, were you before, were you already in the States before um, you went to school? Or went yes, to school? actually, yeah, actually, um, uh, I moved to uh, California at the age of four. So I grew up in, in I, was, I was in Los Angeles from four till the age of 10. Then I went back to Mexico from 10 to 15, and then I came back to California. And so, I mean, it was, so you had, you had some, of, some of a similar upbringing as I. I mean, I was born in Tijuana and my parents um, immigrated to San Diego when I was probably like two or three years old. But oh, there you go. Um, I don't remember ever not either speaking Spanish or English. And um, I didn't have any, I, 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 we spoke Spanish at home. So I presume I spoke, by the time I got to kindergarten, I was already fluent in English. So it must have been watching TV and like my pals or something. So right. I, you probably had that similar kind of um, upbringing. I so, did actually, I did. And, and um, I remember that, you know, when we moved to California, uh, to California, I mean, I was four, so I was, I was speaking English, uh, Spanish, but then uh, my younger brother learned how to speak English a little faster than we did because he did spend his entire time watching TV while we were in school. And at that time in the seventies, actually uh, the school was bilingual. So I, I went to an elementary school in Florence Avenue that taught English and Spanish simultaneously. So there wasn't any of the kind of um, pushback that you have with in conservative circles about so-called bilingual education. Back no, then. I was really no, I was very fortunate because by the time when I went back to Mexico, I I could write in Spanish and I, clearly. Wonder, I mean, and when did you do? When did you do? Were you always somehow immersed in the visual either? maybe not so much making stuff, but absorbing things. I mean, one of the um, pivotal moments in my life that I can recall was that in San Diego, they have the world famous San Diego Zoo. And adjacent to it is Balboa Park, where they have the Museum of Man and various other museums. But they also had this um, artist village. They called it the Spanish village, but basically there were studios for artists. And I remember um, we would always go there up when my parents would drop us off at the zoo at a very young age. And I remember encountering um, established artists doing their thing and I was always very intrigued by that. Do you, when, at what moment did you sort of have this inspiration or inclination to pursue your area of, uh, as an artist? I mean, to do it professionally, that really came until I was in college, but I mean, as a I feel the influence has been around since I was a child, you know, even just uh, watching my mom cook or my aunts and my grandmother. I, I grew up with a lot of women around me. And I, I, I would say that actually just, I was thinking about this of how, uh, with I think the, the, the notion of process, well, there's a lot of cooking involved and the things that are happening was really my initiation into my understanding of, of art and, and process per se, right? But then being in Mexico, it's really difficult to, to not be surrounded by, by art in all shapes and forms with all the, the work that the artisans, I mean, you're surrounded by, by it on a daily basis. And then, you know, with all the different um, holidays and everything changes, the markets change. I mean, everything is continuously being transformed throughout the year. So you're, you're exposed to it, whether you want it or not, it's so sure. present. So. Sure. I mean, you, you mentioned the market, it's a visual cornucopia, especially in Mexico City. But one could certainly say this about Mexico in general, but that was yes. one of the things that I'd mentioned to Alexis, which is certainly appropriate now. And that was the fascination that the surrealists had with um, Mexico 
and um, and as well as um, as you know, many people had gone to Mexico and they were absolutely fascinated by it. I mean, Manuel Alvarez brought with his photographs of the shops, and one that comes to mind, the optometrist shop, where you see all of these eyes. That's a very classic um, image that really reveals a lot about the so-called magical realism of Mexico. But anyway, let's jump up to 1993. So that's when you went to school where? I actually, um, I went to school at Fresno State. So I, I, I actually started uh, in 1989. I graduated from high school and I, I was living very close to uh, Fresno in a smaller town called Huron. Uh -huh. it's, a very, it's an agricultural uh, town in, in the Central Valley. And that's where my, my father was working. He had a permanent job um, working in a cotton field. So in a cotton gin, which, you know, there were cotton fields. So we were in the middle of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, you know, surrounded by land. So the closest university was Fresno State. And I, I went there from 1989 to 1993. With, um, but I did my sophomore year in Buff State, in Buffalo, New York. Were, were your parents always pushing you to like pursue anything in education? Um, in other words, never, never. Wow. Okay. No, uh, they were happy with us to be in school. It didn't okay. matter what we were doing yeah. as long as we yes. graduated, we had good yeah. grades. That was yeah. just, that so was, the, the, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I had mentioned that my, that to, um, friends of mine, for instance, um, you have like the children of like really well known celebrities, whether they're like actors, or like um, musicians. And often there's this, what Harold Bloom called the anxiety of influence. The context that he spoke that in what had to do with artists or writers um, or whatever might be working in the field of culture, having to deal and grapple with their, um, with those that had gone before them and to try to advance the um, contributions that they had. And so that's why I would tell my friend that um, I never went into the field of heavy duty machinery. My father was a heavy duty mechanic because I knew I could never become a better mechanic than him. So rather than, than him. you know, get rid of that Freudian um, heavy weight there. So I sort of went into um, the field of the arts. But anyway, what did you study? Because when we first met, um, the work that you had contributed in some of the projects we have done together were like the um, sculpture that is behind you. And so um, my first inclination was that you were like an installation artist or maybe a sculptor that has um, a very kind of expanded formal purview. But then by looking over your, um, your website, I mean, I was astonished by the diversity and the heterogeneity of your practice. I mean, you do a lot of stuff that might be considered sort of um, social-based practices and as well as like, um, those embroidery works, which we'll look at in a minute, but um, is this where you were studying in Fresno S State College? Is that where you went? No. <laughs> I actually, one, one thing uh, that happens to all art students is that, is that we go through uh, the formal training and you just really never, you never know what, what materials and what techniques you're actually going to end up working with. Uh, I, I, I don't think, um, you, you, tr you do stay loyal to the ideas that you're working with and you're developing, but I think as you, as you are being shaped by the world and you're moving around like I have, um, I, I've been influenced by a lot of the things that, that, I've, that I've, you know, I've encountered. So my work is actually, I'm, I'm, tra I'm formally trained as a painter. Uh -huh. So I feel that I do see my wor the, the world and I compose the world in a very, um, in a painterly way. But I've been influenced very much so by, by traditional techniques, you know, by work that, it, that I've seen and I grew, grew up as I uh, living in Mexico and in other parts of the world as well, that I see that are the handmade and that is very present and that has a, a historical context and legacy. So you would say so that that's you, where yeah. much of the influence. So you would say that you that that painting um, formation is still really much part of your metier and maybe the the influence of how you approach your practice outside of the sort of traditional or conventional um, media of painting. Would you say that's true? I mean, if you look at the flowers behind you, I don't know the what it consists of the piece there that I'm referring to. Um, it's basically found materials that you, where do you get the, um, and I'm referring to the sculpture, the two-dimensional piece behind you. 
Um, I. What did you? I've what did actually, you, do you do? You go to like. Um, I mean, it looks like materials that you may have acquired from markets and so forth, and etc. And when I first saw that work, I hate to jump so far ahead, but when I was first saw that work, I was really, um, you know, I was thinking of like. Um, obviously references which one hates to i guess i'm exposing my kind of bias here but i you know i thought about like hannah wilkie and and but other artists even like um who's that guy's name jim who works with a lot of flowers um but in any case where do you get your materials to do those pieces from and do you would you set out like uh, do you do like studies first um i mean obviously you really engage the architectonics of the exhibition space and it seems because you're bringing in these materials from um locales that have a very strong social uh, contact those components eventually come into the space as well um but do you first start out with like you know you see the exhibition space and then you begin to um consider the context if it's a group show what's like the thematic or um if sometimes curators are so generous to say that well you know that you might be you're going to be with this next to this artist or that artist and do you consider those factors into your um conceptualization of your work and here i'm talking about the, the flower works i don't know if i'm yes, describing I'm them correctly as quote unquote flower works yeah, I mean, um, they're floral installations. And actually, you know, uh, it's interesting because I actually, what I do, the first consideration is just to know what type of wall I am working with, independent of anything else, the theme, or I just need to know the space beforehand. That's, that's basically the, the premise of, of the, 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 my starting point of how you I will- use the walls or do you also use part of the floor or do you use the ceiling as well? Do you, you know, I, I haven't, but that's, a, that's actually a very, uh, I haven't done that yet. I have not been, uh, I haven't worked in, in such large spaces, but definitely I do want to take them into that realm of actually the scale changing dramatically because I, the works that I've created, um, the floral works, I have not been, I, I, this is uh, something very recent, but they, they're not, you know, they're not huge. They just, they're, you know, my, the length of my arm span and just maybe a little larger. Um, but I, that is a, a place I want to take them to. And, and when you, you were asking me about where do I buy the flowers or where do I get the material, I actually happen to live in South Bronx. And there's, um, there's a peculiarity about living in, in, in an area as the Bronx. We don't have that many art stores and art. Um, actually, the city itself nowadays, you know, we're losing most, most of them anyway. But my my location of finding uh, materials for art have been the dollar stores so they actually have been when i go into an art store i see materials and i try to find the materials that i can i can uh, take from that context and transfer it into the way into my own work and and reconfigure it in a way that will work for me and i've noticed and i started doing this because i was teaching middle school in in hunts point for about five years and that was where i would get the the bulk of the of, of the art material that i've been working with with my children so that's it, it's funny how the work that i or the material that i started working with my students then became actually the material that i began to use in my own practice fantastic that's great to hear that's great to hear well let's see how you sort of arrive there if you will i want to um go down memory lane if you will and um see about um some of your early projects um, Like, for instance, um, can you mention some things about um, the piece that I, I shared with you? Yes. Uh, yes. Why don't we start with that? Okay, hold on. Let me get that up here. Are those images coming up? Uh, I can I can see 
one image, but if you can um, hey, yeah, make I'm it sorry. larger. Yeah. Okay, here we go. All right, can you see that now? Yes, yes, right. I can see that now. So this is actually, this belongs to a series of, um, of, uh, of pieces that I created in, between Greece and Athens, Greece and, and Brussels. This is actually the, the last piece, but they are part of a series that, um, where I am uh, addressing and um, in some way uh, speaking about the disappearance of 43 students from Ayotzinapa, Guerrero. I don't know if you know that uh, five years ago, we, 43 stu students from a, um, a teacher uh -huh. school were, were disappeared and we still don't know where they are. And when I heard this, I actually was not living in the States or I wasn't in Mexico, but it was such a, uh, it, it, it just, it, this is the way I, I, I wanted to respond and I invited other people to respond to it because we wanted people to know that this was happening in Mexico. And so for 43 consecutive days, um, I invited people to create one piece for each student. And these pieces were uh, abstract pieces, they, they, um, they, but they did contain, the, the, fi the center of figure is actually the silhouette of my body. Right. And I'll, okay. and I'll show you a little later how I came to, to isolating my body that way. But so these 43 pieces were, were in, um, in demand of, of uh, and, and also we wanted to, to raise awareness of, of this horrible and, and tragic uh, situation that was happening. And, and they still are actually in, in public spaces and private spaces in Athens. Uh, this piece was the last piece, as I said, and it was created in, in Brussels, Belgium. I was invited by a friend to, to do the work there. And the piece actually was created in the outside, in the, uh, that, uh, outside of the window of the space. Uh -huh. And it was intact for three months outside, you see? It was completely, nobody so this, touched this, it. This right here is not the same space here or different? It is the same space. Oh. It's the same space. Okay, but so that piece, go ahead. And, and so it's, it's made with strings. I, I, I work a lot with string because I'm, I'm very familiar with the string. I, I've been embroidering for many, many years. So I, I felt it was a natural uh, way to incorporate two different elements that I work with very much so. And so it's the string and, and the petals. And in the bottom of, uh, of the piece are the names of, of the students with a message that was... Where would, they, where would they be located on this installation? In the bottom part, and you'll okay. see that um, at the end. This is I'm still creating. It's the process. So if you continue, and then people from um, from from Brussels, the Mexican community, and it was open to anyone who wanted to come and, and participate and, and the tags be there. With, correct? Yes. Yes. Wow, that's very strong. But I was very um, just also amazed that the piece did not it was not destroyed at all. People knew what the piece was about. Uh, the person who runs the space told me that they, when they understood what it was about, they were just respected. Nobody touched it or destroyed it at all. It just, it was intact. And let me tell you, um, masking tape is a wonderful material. This was outdoors and this was done in February in Brussels and it's cold there and it, it remained. So this, so this piece started in Athens, you said? Yes. The, uh, so there are 43 so, different pieces. Those, so there's 43 different, this is just one of the 43? Of the 43. And, and the, project, the project itself is called 43 for them, or 43 para ellos. And you can see the entire, the entire project and every single piece um, in a Tumblr account that I have. It's called 43, para, 43 for them and 43 or 43 para ellos. And that's on your website, the Tumblr account? That's also, info? yes. Good. Yes, it's and, also on my website. And I was going to ask you, um, what year was this when you started this in Athens? This, I started this in 2016. Okay. Sorry, 2016, I believe. Yeah. Um, and that was, do you, do you recall when the students came up missing? It was that year or the year before? This is five years ago. The okay. students disappeared five years ago in September, of September 26. And um, it's wonderful. Very, very and these candles here was this part of your um part of the project itself too it is it, for that day we decided to name each student and as we named them we 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 um we just like 
we lighted a candle for each student and we, we, we said their names out loud. Oh, that's really strong. And then what is this that we see here on which the um, other information rests on? This is what that we're looking at here. Yeah, so then you see there's um, the names of the students and some no, of the tags. I mean, beyond, and like, beyond that, on the other side of the window. Um, oh, the other, oh, you know what? The other side of the window, I think it's some, something that someone just placed. And there must have been like a little table, but there, we also had information. No, it, just, to it, yeah. it, just, it looks like a, a text, a Mexican textile, like a set up or something. Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, right. yeah I, very, very. I and so how long were you in Athens? Wow, that's a great shot. Um, so and so this, this gallery is actually. This was for, mm -hmm. for how long? How long was this up this for? Was, this was up for three months wow, very in nice. Brussels. And so how long were you in Athens? Because I know that you had um, done a few projects there. I did. I, um, I lived in Athens for six years. Did you? Wow. So you, this wasn't like a residency or anything, right? This was like you moved out to. It, it, was, a, it was a pretty long residency. Oh, it years. was. <laughs> <laughs> Can you say something about this? This was an early project, right? Um, yeah. So when I when I arrived in Athens, uh, everybody was. Uh, I'm I'm married to a, a Greek man, and we arrived in Athens in 2010. And everybody saw us with this face of like, "Are you insane? You came to Athens in 2010 in the middle of the European the the, yeah. the European crisis." So, yeah, <laughs> that's that's just how things happen in life. I. Um, I, I decided to go in Athens because I felt I needed to also experience the country where my husband was from, and I wanted to actually be in Greece more than just during the summer, um, for many, many reasons. And so while I was there, uh, it, a lot of very, very interesting cultural events began to take place as a response to everything that was happening, happening uh, politically, economically, and socially. And so this project and, consisted of so this project was, uh, there was an organization that was very close to where I, I used to live in the center of Athens. I was right in between an area called um, Kolonaki, which could be considered like Madison Avenue. And then on the other side, I was in the Lower East Side. I mean, I was divided by just a couple of streets. So I, I, I had the anarchist on one side and I had, you know, <laughs> people from a very different background on the other side, but in the middle, I, all these amazing projects were surfacing. And this one was called uh, Ludens Lab. And it was run by a, an amazing um, a writer. And she, uh, she I, I, was, I would see them gathered and just doing, it was mostly literature based, but when I approached her about this project, she was really interested. And so we, I gave a workshop of how to make piñatas. Many people had never seen a piñata or, you know, or actually have, have, you know, they've never broken one. So we invited people from the organization and the community at large to just create piñatas and we broke them in the space. Um, and it was really a, a, a wonderful way to, to both, you know, introduce what a little bit, some, I felt like it was also moments where, where we all needed to kind of experience different things because there was so much going on socially and economically that, and politically that uh, the more we shared with each other, was it was very important the coming together as community was very very important wow especially and in Athens. How, how many how many um how did you uh i mean it seemed like there was a lot of um what we might call like social based work that was occurring here like um for instance i was very intrigued by the barber shop um so yes uh, one, one um I, so here you were, were you participating both as an artist and working as a curator? No, I was just participating as a, a curator organizer with an artist friend of mine. So uh -huh. my friend, Sotiris Papanicolaou, he's a, a professional photographer in Athens. We, we actually, was one of the first artists that, that I met, we got together and we wanted to, to create different, um, different events and different spaces. And Athens is still, although it's changing because clearly as all cities, large cities are changing, it, 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 um, it still has that, that, you know, that, um, 
that mom and pop shops that we all love and miss yeah. about, you know, uh, New York. I felt that I actually, the, the New York that I missed when I was here in, in, in living in actually in New York in 2003, I, I caught it when I was in Athens. Like I, I imagine that that's what New York used to be right. back in the 80s, 70s, 80s. Well, Athens is that. And there was such a vibrancy. So we, we decided that we wanted to invite artists to enter or, you know, to exhibit in the different barbershops in the city. And we wanted to do a series of, of um, not only barbershops, but, you know, uh, bakeries, butcher shops. But it was just so much work that we, we, just, uh, we just did at the barbershop. And, and we invited artists to exhibit in different barbershops. And we had an opening for each show, which was very... Um, a, very exciting. We were busy with that. That, that summer was just nonstop of, of art shows in different barbershops in the city. It was fun too because the barbers actually had the barbershops or the uh, the spaces were open, and sometimes right. they were cutting hair, and we were you know gathered there as as they were working. Wonderful. So you were you were doing a lot of um, you were working as an artist and then also as a curator, and um, a lot of your projects there had this social sort of context or socially based um, um, aspect to them, correct? They do. I, I, I like to collaborate a lot. I, I feel that in collaboration, there there's so many things that, that um, are born, you know? It's, it's not so much um, doing my own work, uh, you know, in my studio or wherever I work, and, and that's, all, that's all I can give. I felt that as I collaborate, I, you know, the world and the possibilities are just more, are heightened. They're, they're, you, I, I feel that I can, you begin to understand the world more so, you know, if, if you, you get involved with the community that you live in or where you live in. And so it, was, it seems that the, um, you certainly had expanded very, very much your uh, formal and um, kind of context-based work from painting into this whole other arena, which you've also taken, of course, here to New York. I mean, could you say something about this? project that you organized um, in the Bronx? This was a project that was organized by um, um, Virginia Grice, a very good uh, Chicana writer from, uh -huh. uh, from Texas. And we, um, and many other friends, we, we initiated the idea, but then we got many, many other people involved. So we had different workshops in a, um, in a park in the, uh, where she lived up in, here in the Bronx. And, um, and this was organized through um, a Parks and Recreation here in New York. So we invited people to come in and create a piñata. There was people uh, teaching people how to, use, how to use marbles. There was uh, yoga, uh, just different activities throughout the day. And it was just a one day event. But I, what I was gonna say about how I, I feel that I, it, it was an easy, or in some way, an easy transition to create projects that are only my projects and then also community projects. I guess it also has a lot to do with, with the fact that when I moved to New York, I, I mean, I didn't know anybody other than my husband. So in, in, order, in, in, a, in a way to actually create community and get to understand where I was, it was important for me to, to understand what kind of things I could actually contribute and how, how I could collaborate with, with, with the people that are already there. So it was a very natural, um, a way to explore all those possibilities and also make friends and, and understand uh, how I can collaborate with organizations that are also within the community where I live in. And can you remind us again, what year was that when you, when you arrived in New York? What for you? 2003. 2003. And then, 2003. then you, then you went to Athens afterwards later. Um, I went to actually, let me just backtrack a little bit. After I graduated from college, what year was I, that? Uh, after I graduated from Fresno State, I moved to San Francisco. Okay. And from, so in San Francisco, I was in San Francisco for about um, about total of 10 years. Okay. And, and then I moved to New York. So in two, 2003, I was in New York, um, and I lived in New York for seven years before moving to Athens. And were you, were you already, um, obviously, I think, um, a practicing artist in terms of not just making your work, but doing, you know, what we have to do when we don't have like that kind of institutional, well, at least I'm speaking from my experience. Um, yes. As an ind independent curator, it's like I'm always juggling and so forth. Were you already sort of entering into the field in San Francisco at that time? You know, not, not as much as when I arrived in New York. 
I think in, in San Francisco, I was younger and it was a very different scene. It was, it was, yeah, there was a lot of partying. It was, you know, I was in my early twenties. So, I mean, it was a very different, uh, yeah. I also, you know, partying, but also we were also very involved in a lot of community uh, organizing that I felt as when I moved to New York, because I did not know many people, I had, I sort of had left that part behind. But then I'm, I feel very fortunate that now that I'm back in New York and now that I, you know, I have many friends that are involved in many uh, projects and, and community organizing, um, I, I'm, I'm able to get much more involved than, than, than initially when I arrived in New York. So was there a lot, was there um, a big challenge or a, a, a lot of difficulty in terms of um, once you moved to New York to establish, yes. begin establishing yourself and 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 for like let's say somebody who might be watching that's um, thinking of coming to New York or what have you um, what were the what would you say would be kind of a a key element to trying to um, get the ball rolling so to speak. And you also uh, we have to um, remember that when I, even during the time I was in school, I mean, we, we spoke about the art world, right? It was about the art world. It wasn't about the art market. Yeah. And I think that once that transition was made, the, everything changed. I yeah. mean, we're, 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 not, we're not thinking about uh, art creation and art making in the same way as we thought back in the 90s. You know, now it's more geared towards yeah. specific yeah specific ways of moving and navigating through the art through the art market which i think i still am not quite there clearly as you yeah. can see i'm very community oriented with my projects uh, my strategy is not a a necessarily market strategy i live in the community that is not about the market but it's more about community and i'm very aware and i'm very invested about that um so so yeah i think it's also finding and understanding what your work is all about and how you want to um, contribute and, and, and collaborate and share that work where you are. I, I, and also the notion about what an artist is, right? I, I feel that everybody has such a different tra trajectory. I mean, I, I'm here now, I, but I've lived in four different countries. I, I speak four different languages. Who knew this was gonna happen? I had, this was not a part of a plan. It's just things sort of like life happens to you and you're navigating and moving through, through it. And hopefully as you move and you navigate, you also continue to do your artwork. And that continues to expand and to clarify and to be more, more, um, more specific in certain ways. Um, you were saying that you see that my practice is very varied, and it's it's uh, it's interesting because when I see my practice, I feel like there's a a united there's a thread permeating through the entire work where I feel that I would hope that that the traditional aspect of it or the artisanal aspect of what the work um, of what the inspiration for the creation of much of my practice is, you know, that you might not understand clearly what, yeah. you know, why she's doing flowers and then she's doing puppet picado and she, then she's embroidering. But I, I, um, I feel that I, I'm, I'm intentional in trying to, to work with certain techniques that I consider that are, that are, that, that come from a, from a, that the source is more, uh, more artisanal and that I, I want that to be, to be very present. Sure. No, I mean, my, my sort of, um, why I was so intrigued was sort of my introduction to your work came through what you were presently working on, even though I know that you're doing many other things as well. But then knowing that you had this painting um, education, if you will, now makes a lot of sense just by the very visual aspect of the type of work you do, regardless of the context in which it manifests, whether it's like the floral pieces on your wall or the um, more socially based projects that you do with collaborators. There seems to be this very sort of painterly quality. Um, even some filmmakers like David Lynch or Peter Greenaway um, or Derek Jarman that actually had gone to, even a, a dear friend of mine that had passed on, Stuart Croft, who's known for his film and video practice, he started off as a painter, but those other film directors, and as well as my um, friend Stuart Croft, you can s notice this painterly quality in their film. But just to mention something about, you said that you entered into New York with this other aspect of like A, the sort of art world, and then B, the sort of art market. Um, it's a very 
as you know, a very complicated situation that we find ourselves in now. And um, it's hard to imagine a silver lining in the midst of the bodies piling up because of COVID-19 and the police brutality against African-Americans and generally people of color and the things that are happening right now. But it's almost like that um, so-called art world that was so dependent on the financial side seems to be in a quagmire, which I mean, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to relish in um, the negativity, but there could be something very positive. And I mean, it's a very interesting bracket because when I arrived in New York, there was, um, this was in 1990, and there was an article in the Times that I remember very well because it was so, um, it was such a benchmark in the sense that they were describing the descriptions that um, dealers, which has now become the nomenclature, but at the time, this article in the Times was describing how the um, term gallerist seemed to be an anachronism that is not used anymore. And that idea of the gallerist was of the Leo Castelli tradition mm -hmm. in which um, they would nurture artists and they would uh, support them um, because they truly um, felt that these were artists that need to be seen, regardless whether they were making, they were, they were selling a lot of money, but now that you have either selling art, but now you have the, the dealer. And so the article was trying to sort of position this idea of the dealer as more of this kind of mercantile mentality. And so it's like right. all of a sudden now, like that world is up in flames. And I'm just wondering, because of what you said, what's going to be on the other side? Absolutely. And what you also mentioned that it's very integral just to keep making work and to be sincere with your own um, sense of who you are as an artist. And I, the other interview that I had with Alexis, because I asked him a similar question, and he also similarly raised something what you had just said, but he also said that one of the key things, and I think you can probably agree with him, was to try to establish um, a camaraderie among other artists that have a similar ethos. Um, I'm certain that we all come across, even in the curatorial field as well, in any field, you have people that can be very apart, apart um, you know, they're opportunistic about what they do. And it's like, and the, the other move to try to advance themselves professionally, mm -hmm. so to speak. But, mm -hmm. but as the world is burning, it's like, it's back to what it's really about, no? Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. But in, but in any case, but what I want to do is talk about some of your more two-dimensional work that um, I also found really quite fascinating because it too is quite heterogeneous. And here I'm referring to the um, comics-inspired art. At what, which was the takeoff point here? Which came first, as they say, um, the egg or the, whatever that um, antidote is? Because I see where the photo interventions, book interventions, collages, or mixed media. So, so it, actually, they're they're um, they're in chron chronological order. The embroideries came first, then the mixed media, then the collage, and then the book interventions, and then lastly the 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 the, the photos. And so the embroideries came first. You're saying the embroideries came first. And what is the source material here? So the source material for the for these pieces is. Um, have you seen the Mexican adult books, those little, the, the little books that you normally see a lot of people, uh, you is know, that workers? Like a, is, that like a trick, is that a trick question? <laughs> you no, know, no, I, I haven't I mean, seen it. Because, you're, oh, because not, you said you were I'm, born, you said I'm you were born in Tijuana. No, but but what, this is a funny anecdote. Um, my <laughs> wife was doing these, she makes films and also is a painter. And she was doing a series of, um, of paintings and she was getting these um, kind of like, uh, fetish magazines like uh -huh. Big Rear Ends or this and that, but they were all like women that she was basing her paintings on this. And she happened to leave them around, you know, our house. And um, my stepdaughter, who's now in her, about to, she's 29, about to turn 29, um, she was like about 10. Her uh -huh. whatever school friends were over. And then, um, my stepdaughter told my wife, she goes, 
just like Raul leave like these magazines around. <laughs> so, so I'm not familiar with those, but um, <laughs> I am familiar with like Alarma, as you. Oh but, no, no, yeah, that's probably, that's, well, that's which is probably that's, more disturbing. I would say. Is, Alarma, I mean, they're really they're more equally disturbing in different ways. They're both yeah. equally disturbing, but in very different ways. The other one is much more explicit and, and you know, and just vile. It's so yeah. Explain it's, to the audience who is not familiar. Yes. With the so these are small comic books that are are very um, they're geared towards the male gaze, and the narratives are very macho. The women is always portrayed as a sexual object. And I, you know, when I go to the Mercado, I would see them, there were just piles and piles of these little books. And a, a good friend of mine, artist friend of mine that lives in San Francisco actually met, also works with these books, but with the images, but in a very different way. And when I saw that he was working with them, I actually was, he, he used to uh, run a gallery called Balasso Gallery in San Francisco. And as we were spending time together, I began to familiarize, familiarize myself even more with these magazines. And I had seen them in Mexico, Mexico. So then when I would go back, I actually would bring some back as well. And I, I began to actually, um, I, I, I wanted to, to use the image that was portrayed in these books in a very different way and also take them out of that context. So as a painter, it was a very natural transition. Instead of using the canvas, I began to use um, the, the fabric that is used for the, for the servilletas, for the tortillas, uh -huh. you know? So yeah. in Mexico, we have a, a tradition of embroidering uh, a piece of fabric with just different, you know, like floral elements or the fruits or day of the week. And, and they're, they're, they tend to be embroidered in the center and then there's crochet in the edge. And then, you know, you fold them and, and then you put, your, as you're warming up the tortillas, you put the, the, the tortillas in, inside a basket and they stay warm so you can you know talk and do the things that you need to do and the tortillas are always warm so i i felt that that was such a a beautiful way to incorporate something that i was very familiar with but yet the imagery was going to be something different and i began to isolate the image um the images are directly taken from 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 the comic books and i i would clearly you know just some of the times I would change the colors in the fabric of the, uh, of, of the things that the women were wearing, of the garments, or, or, or I would add nails, or you know, just different elements. But, but it's, it's really the image taken directly from the, the Mexican adult comic book. So all, so all of it's just, it just is strictly embroidery, or do you have other material no, in any of them? No, it's, it's strictly embroidery in, um, and the, the image is strictly embroidery. And what I was also going to say is that I uh, I collaborate with my mom. She I don't I don't crochet. I don't know how to crochet. So my mom everything that is crocheted is that is done through uh, my mom creates. Uh, that's the crocheting in the work and all of the work. These so it's a collaboration between her and I. Quite incredible. Um, very 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 interesting. And so all of this is um, on cotton and yes. Yes. Huh? And some of them are, they appear to be almost like blanket size. And, uh, yeah, um, I actually, have the, I have created some very large, I created a series of nine pieces that I worked with um, a comic book artist from the Bronx. They're not in the website yet, yet, but uh, that is, those are the largest pieces that I've created. And, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, but I still don't have them up. That's quite all right. And then from there, you, you expanded that um, strategy, if you will, or that um, technique or concept into other ways of working as in this piece here. Um, right, so then as I'm working with the book, I decided to go in and actually, I, instead of just, uh, instead of isolate, isolating the entire figure, I began to work with the, the pages and the imagery of the female um, face. And so I began in, uh, doing interventions on the faces and then uniting all of them using nail polish. And these are, what are they mounted on? They're not actually mounted. It's okay. just, they're all folded and then glued in the back. Oh, wow. Nice. Very nice. And occasionally you, you allow some of the textual elements to enter into the composition? Very, yes, very little, but yes. Very strong stuff. Um, and then from here you did the, um, the collage elements. Oh, wow. This is, Yes. Now this is completely different, right? So now you right. do the inverse here. You've now excited so the pictorial or figurative elements to 
It, right. So now I'm working exclusively with, with just the text. I, I, I take one entire book and I just eliminate all the text, all the, the text bubbles, and I, I, I superimpose them and, and they're glued, you know, on top of each other until the entire surface is. is and this, and this again, is, is, is it on a foundation or not? This is it is. It's, it's on, a, uh, on paper, on a heavy, heavy paper. Those are very fascinating. And um, thank you. They're very, very nice. And then I, I was able to exhibit these pieces at the Elizabeth Foundation, uh -huh. thanks to uh, an invitation by Rocio Alvarado. Good. What do you ago. remember? What year is that? What year was that? That was, uh, yeah, it was 2016 or 17. Do you remember the title of that show? Oh God, no. But you went to. You were in. Um, I guess it was called um, the X Files or S Files. Were you in? Yes. The, yes. Yes. That was yes. before the biennial. Um, yes. I don't know what happened to the biennial. It's like, it's. Um, yeah. I wish they would continue that. Um, right. In any case. Uh, yes. And so for this, you went into the actual intervention itself, into the... Into the uh, book itself. So, so now there, I'm actually using the, the entire book, and I'm, I'm removing the text of, in the cover. I don't know, um, it's unfortunate, I actually, now that I'm going, now that you're uh, showing this, I should actually just leave one as a sample so you can see what they originally looked like. So the acid, so yes, it, go ahead. So yes, I actually use acetone to remove all the text. And, and then I go in with a hammer and nail and all the little punctured uh, dots that you see are, are created using hammer and nail. And this is the entire book. So, so um, it, it, when you, the actual piece is the book itself. So this, and I go ahead, mm -hmm. go ahead. I was gonna say, and what became really interesting because it became, it, it gave it a painter quality is that because it's done in this very, um, uh, very inexpensive material. When I applied the acetone, I mean, clearly the inside is pulp paper, uh, but the outside has a little bit of gloss. So when I, I remove the text with, a, um, with the acetone, you can see some traces of the ink left behind. And that was very interesting for me to just find out how I, can, I could move the, the ink around if I wanted to, or just remove, remove it completely. So just to clarify, your intervention it consists of the acetone to remove the textual sources, the elements yes. that's part of the page. And then yes. here, this is already here, and then you just no. punctured it, or did you paint this? No, that was already there. That's the okay. image for the cover. And what, so what what it, what it, I'm curious, what does you mean by the nail markings? Your actual nails? Oh. Yes, so I, I take, because you know, the, the book itself is a little, um, it's not very thick, but you know, let's say if it has 30 pages, I could puncture it by using you know, nail and, and a hammer. I would, you know, place the, the book on top of a, a surface and then I would just hammer it with a nail. And so those little perforations are the perforations that are created by using, by hammering onto the book. Wow, very, very interesting. And so this image right here is the way it is? You haven't altered it? Besides, no, I, yes, it no. Yes. The only alteration was the removal of the text and any and how, other. How many did you show in uh, Rocio's show? Actually, these I did not show. I, I did not show these. She sh I showed the the, the text, text. Uh, bubbles. Have you shown these anywhere yet? I have, but very, very little. Yeah. I, when I was in Athens, I, I created a very large series of these. So it's, you know, I have like 40, 50 of them. Wow, these are really, really interesting. And then finally, or I should say, to continue with this, um, these consist of um, now also what the the comic book cover that you've now what enlarged through your photo process. Correct. So then I took the the, um, the comic book uh, cover, I enlarged it, and then I painted over it. So now. Um, I, the actual print. So I took, you know, you, I created them in a larger format and then I, I went inside the, the, the paper and I, again, using um, nail polish, I painted nice. the image. It's really incredible. Um, and your performance work, I was also very intrigued by that. Um, 
Which is the the ones that you did in in um I actually, you know what, could you, go ahead, go could ahead. We, uh -huh. I was going to say, if you share the screen, I, I have some images, I think, are you referring to the ones uh, in the corners? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's what I'm getting. So let me see. Uh, if, can I share screen? Um, let me see. How do I, let me see. I think you have to, um, you have to enable me to. The participants, I don't know if I'm. To I've participate. Got... You have to enable me to participate in the sharing process. Okay. Um, Allow make host stop video um, more. Okay. Is there a way you can enable me in the bottom um, part, yeah. or if not, we can go. You can go inside into uh, corners. Okay, let me can... go inside of corners here. Um, uh -huh. All right, so here's where I'm at now. Okay, so if you go in, into um, which are the ones that you did um, out in the, I guess the city or landscape, the one that you showed me of the. Um, no. Yeah, here we go. This one. Yes. That one. So. Um, so when I was in Athens, I felt that, uh, let's see, you're, you're jumping. So yeah, like I said, I, I moved to, Ast to Athens in 2010. And again, I didn't, I didn't know anybody except my husband. Right. <laughs> and I realized that it was, um, I felt it's a space that already has so much. It's, it's, it's such, it's, 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 um, Historically, I mean, the weight of, 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 of the city itself, I was living in the center of Athens. Uh -huh. I, I, I wanted to do something that was going to actually just create a subtle ge gesture within the cacophony of, uh, of things that were, were around me constantly. And like I said, you know, I arrived in 2010 right in the middle of, of, uh, of the crisis. So I, I lived for many years under almost daily demonstrations. I, and I lived in the center. I could really smell the tear gas. I, I was tear gassed a couple of times, but it was also a very a, a moments of a lot of change. And I have to say that that I'm very also very inspired with the demonstrations that are happening now here, because uh, they, they they give me a lot of hope for many things that I've seen in, in being in Athens. So I, I I'm completely in support, of course, of the things that are happening right now because there's a I, I can see that. Um, I'm very hopeful, very, very hopeful for many things. So, that, so yeah, so it, the idea with uh, me placing my body in the corners was more about me understanding, I was just enchanted by the different type of materials that are available in the city itself. The diversity of, of materials that, you know, one encounters when, when you are either in an island or, or, or in Athens, it's, it, it, it's, it's a very rich, rich city. It's an old city, so the variety of, of um, of walls and spaces is, is infinite. So I, I wanted to see how my body could, like how once, my, seeing my, my body as a skin and also the, the, the architectural structures as another skin and how that interaction would, um, what kind of tension or what it would create visually. And so then I began to place my body in, in, in the corners. And so besides the architectural aspect in the broader context in which um, some of these interventions appear in. I mean, there's obviously a difference between this pristine gallery space and like, let's say, um, I believe an earlier shot, where is that one, um, was in a um, prayer niche at a mosque. Is that correct or no? Yes, that wasn't. Oh, there it is. You, you can see it. It's it's and um, and I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there's, is there, as I guess we could say a foreigner, I mean, there's also this aspect of the dynamic of an immigrant in a foreign land. I mean, there's always, and that's something certainly that um, anyone can relate to, even if one is not 
the immigrant immigrant or migrant in the more conventional sense, but even as like an outsider within a space that um, they don't have a historical or cultural connection to. I mean, when I was looking at these, I always felt that they were um, equally as well as about what you had been describing. Um, but nonetheless, they're really quite um, appropriate um, today, certainly with questions revolving around um, along the border and so forth. Which leads me to another question. Have you faced a lot of, um, when I use the word challenge, I guess it's a very neutral and diplomatic way of dealing with the um, stuff that's out there. I mean, when I was growing up in San Diego, um, it happened not a lot, but it happened where I would have, or what I would be accosted by um, the immigration officers. And even today when I travel abroad, I mean abroad, um, I mean in the States, depends where I'm at, at where I am, I still feel this sense of, um, of, of, of self-awareness of, of my subjectivity, but in a sense that it's, um, in, in the sense that it, it makes me feel very uncomfortable, not within myself, but then have to negotiate. In other words, in your going to Fresno or New York, did you have to deal with any of that stuff? Um, you know, or like I, maybe I, somebody like pigeonholing you or as an artist, like, oh, you know, you know, this is the kind of work that you do or et cetera. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 uh, I, sometimes, you know, and also the fact that I, maybe I also bring it on to myself because of the, the type of work that I do, that I do work for very traditional techniques or methods and I use color as very present in my work. I, sometimes that does happen. That does happen. But it, at some points I feel like it's, it hasn't been a, a, such a terrible situation where I feel like I can, I can use that to my advantage as well. You know, yeah. I, I've been able to kind of, uh, a maneuver and move around the the way I work and the thing the way I, I um, the themes that I work with and the way that I do that I feel that I can I can get away with a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. So I've it, always found your work now that I'm more um, aware of your work and and much more um, research that you have a, a certain fluidity, but at the same time there is this very kind of formal signature, I guess, or an aspect of your work that now is becoming very palpably, palpably yours, rather mm -hmm. than not mistaking it for um, someone else. And I think that's really a testament to um, your artistic intelligence and how um, sophisticated you are in the work that you do, regardless of how it may be perceived um, externally or by others. But um, in any case, I have to wrap this up because I'm looking at my um, time clock here. I don't want like the um, powers that be to tell me I have to now do some editing or something like that. But anyway, it was wonderful to have this conversation with you and especially for you to participate in this exhibition. Um, again, I apologize for not having, and as well, you know, to everyone else, um, not being able to materialize the exhibition. But in any case, we'll see what's hopefully on the other side um, once we all collectively get there um, yes. in one piece and a better way than um, we began with all of the stuff that's uh, occurring at the present moment. Um, in any case, we thank you again. All right. So no, we'll thank, you. thank you. Okay. We'll see each other in the future and take care of yourself. And uh, maybe I'll see you out there, um, you know, taking our lives back, so to speak, all right? Absolutely, thank yeah. you. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful show. Thank of you. Course. All right, take yeah. care. Nos vemos. Cuídate. Yes.